Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Tioga County uh, Courthouse and uh, Courtroom One. It is my uh, pleasure and honor this morning to uh, get to introduce our esteemed guests this morning and the program that they're going to present. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am jo George Wheeler, the judge here in Tioga County. Um, and in that uh, capacity, I as I said, I have this great honor. I will cut directly to my work so, or to my work so that they may get to theirs. We are joined this morning um, by Chief Justice Emeritus uh, Saylor, uh, who <clears throat> has had a long and distinguished career. He uh, recently retired from the uh, state Supreme Court, uh, where he served as Chief Justice until April of 2021. Uh, prior to his service uh, on this Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which began in, I believe, 1998, uh, following his election, uh, during which he had been a member of the state superior court. In addition to his work uh, as a, an appellate jurist, uh, he has served, uh, began his career in private practice as, as a first assistant district attorney in Somerset County, another small county in uh, a parallel, perhaps, uh, in our careers, because that's, of course, where I had the honor and privilege of starting my legal career. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, Chief Justice has uh, a uh, undergraduate bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, earned his law degree at Columbia, and has a master's in law also from uh, the University of Virginia, because there was not enough to do in the early 2000s during his time. <laughs> Uh, so he <clears throat> accomplished that. He has, in addition to the, his work as a prosecutor uh, and an appellate jurist, uh, served as uh, first deputy attorney general. He ran the Consumer Protection Bureau, I believe, for a period of time. And it is my, as I said, my great pleasure uh, to welcome him here this afternoon. And I believe currently serves as jurist in uh, residency with Duquesne. Uh, <clears throat> seated immediately to uh, his right is uh, Justice Brobson. Justice Brobson has uh, got some local connections, graduate of Lycoming College, uh, accounting and economics, uh, also a graduate, I believe, magna cum laude from Widener. He has served as a jurist in residence uh, with uh, Widener after that for a period of time. He <clears throat> has worked in private practice and was elected uh, initially to the Commonwealth Court, served there uh, with distinction and honor, and is the most recent member of the um, Supreme Court, having been elected last year and having began his term uh, in January of this year. Uh, that <clears throat> election perhaps cut off his full term as President Judge of the Commonwealth Court, as I believe you had been uh, selected by your colleagues and peers uh, early in 2021. Uh, <clears throat> seated immediately uh, to Justice Brobson's right is Justice Doherty. Justice Doherty uh, is uh, obviously uh, happy to be here this morning, I understand, uh, and he is always a presence. Uh, I enjoy his company anytime we get to see him. Justice Doherty's most recent uh, endeavors, uh, in addition to his work as a sitting jurist with the Supreme Court, include his work with the Children's Roundtable, which is a project that I'm very familiar with, one of the most rewarding parts. Additions to my job in moving from district attorney to a judge was to get to experience that side, which has some great challenges. Justice Doherty has a huge amount of experience uh, having served as an administrative judge of the Family Court Division in Philadelphia during his term as a sitting common pleas judge. Uh, he has also served as, uh, I believe, vice chair of the uh, State Trial Judges Conference uh, of the Juvenile, or rather of the Domestic Relations Rules Committee, which I have the privilege of, of sitting on now, uh, know the work that goes on there, and also served on the uh, juvenile Rules Committee, I believe, uh, in addition to his other work. Uh, 
and to his immediate right, uh, we have the state court administrator of Pennsylvania, Jeffrey Moulton. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Moulton uh, also uh, at now serving as the uh, state court administrator, but he also brings some appellate uh, judicial service, having served by appointment to the Superior Court, uh, where he was to which he was appointed uh, by Governor Wolf and unanimously, unanimously confirmed by uh, the State Senate. Uh, he, in addition to his work as a uh, now as the state court administrator, he previously served as counsel immediately prior to uh, Terry Sachs, who is also with us, and I'll get to her in just a moment. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, Mr. Moulton uh, graduated from Columbia Law School, where I understand he was the uh, editor-in-chief of the Law Review. In addition to that, has served as a prosecutor uh, and served as a clerk in both the Circuit Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and at the uh, United States Supreme Court. Uh, brings a wealth of experience to the position and I will say as a judge it's a, always a uh, pleasure uh, to work with the administrative office uh, under his leadership and the other fine individuals who work every day to make the system work as well as possible and as smoothly as possible. <clears throat> Seated immediately to uh, Mr. Moulton's right is Terry Sachs. Uh, Terry Sachs is currently chief counsel to the state Supreme Court. In that capacity, she provides counsel and advice, uh, as I understand, in non-adjudicative matters to the uh, court. Uh, she also serves as a liaison to the various boards which are under the supervision of the court, including, I believe, the IOLTA board, uh, the disciplinary boards, uh, the conduct board, <clears throat> and Prior to her uh, joining or taking her current position in 2020, I believe, uh, she worked in private practice uh, doing both trial work and appellate work, uh, has been recognized as a super lawyer, uh, and brings uh, a great deal of experience uh, to the position. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things happen, have happened in the last several years during COVID. The, there have been a lot of transition in uh, membership, but I would say as a judge, having gone through that, we've, we've had very good leadership from our justices in the administrative court. court. We've been able to function uh, and carry on, and I would thank them. That's a slight aside. Last but not least, seated to uh, <clears throat> her right and uh, at the far end of the table, is our own uh, Justice Mundy, who is no stranger to anyone in this room. Justice Mundy uh, served uh, initially as a law clerk to the Honorable uh, President Judge Kemp. Uh, I had the privilege as district attorney to work with her during her time as uh, a volunteer public defender. Uh, she has worked uh, for decades in the private practice of law. In addition to that, um, during her time in private practice, served, I believe, on the hearing board for the disciplinary, uh, for disciplinary hearings. <clears throat> in addition, uh, or in her appellate career, she was initially elected to the Superior Court. Uh, she was uh, appointed to fill a vacancy to the state Supreme Court, subsequently elected uh, to serve uh, a full term. And it is my distinct honor and privilege, as I said, who have been able to introduce everyone this morning, welcome you formally and officially to Tioga County. And at this point, I believe we'll be turning the matter over to Justice Mundy, uh, who will take it from here. One last uh, remark, I saw Attorney Leet walking around with CLE forms. Anyone that didn't get a CLE form but wishes credit for the program today should see Attorney Leet. And with that, thank you. Thank you, President Judge Wheeler, and thank you for your hospitality to, here today at one of, in my opinion, most beautiful courtrooms in the Commonwealth, and as which you all know, the courtroom in which I started along my path of legal uh, journey. Um, as, a, um, as Pennsylvanians, uh, we all have been endowed with, inherited a great rich history, and um, certainly um, leading that history or what we're focusing on today is 
uh, the Supreme Court's history. And so I'm going to start today with a, um, a little bit of a program that we did in conjunction with the court's 300th anniversary, which we commemorated officially in May of 2022. And this program was put together in honor of that anniversary. Um, it was a two-day symposium that was held at the National Constitution Center. So we've kind of taken clips of that program and that's what we are intending to present in part here today. And I'm going to start with the early history of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The history of uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is rooted in William Penn's provincial courts that began in 1684. And as you are probably aware, William Penn was most famous as a religious dissenter and his experiences with the English courts influenced how he thought about the courts and gave him some opportunity to think what he wanted to do when and where he was given the opportunity to form his own set of courts here in Pennsylvania. And one of the um, stories that is told with regard to William Penn and his experiences is in 1670, William Penn and William Mead um, were Quakers and they were attending a religious meeting for which they were arrested. And when William Penn asked the court with which law he was charged, uh, the court vaguely responded, well, the common law. And so William Penn and William Mead were put on trial and you know, despite threats and insistence from the court, as well as the town mayor, um, the jury refused to convict them. And so in response to their acquittal, the court threw William Penn, William Meade, and the jury in jail and fined them. Um, so from that experience, uh, Penn wanted to, um, it wanted to, um, set forth a system because he learned the importance of a jury and he certainly learned the importance of an independent neutral court system. And um, as you can tell from the story in England, that wasn't what the scenario was. The um, courts were actually the prosecutorial arm of the king. So Penn's vision when he came to Pennsylvania was for a ju judiciary that was aspirational and utopian, that courts were open for justice, Justice was not sold, denied, or delayed. And um, the uh, establishment of the provincial court in 1684 uh, consisted of five judges who sat in Philadelphia, and then they were required to ride circuit to try titles to land, and all suits in law and equity, which were held outside the jurisdiction of the county courts, which were then held by the justices of the peace. The, um, the act of 1684 created a statewide provincial court with original and appellate jurisdiction, and it was colloquially known as the Supreme Court. The complicated part of the history is, resides in the period between 1684 and 1722 before the court was formally created by statute. And during this four decade stretch, the British Crown repeatedly disallowed efforts by Penn and the General Assembly of the colony to establish a permanent judicial system. The acts passed by the Pennsylvania General Assembly at that time had to be submitted to the Crown for approval, and that was a hurdle that proved to be the downfall of many previous acts to attempt to formally establish a Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania judiciary. Um, but through the fortuitous circumstances and legislative persistence, the Judiciary Act of 1722 was eventually passed into law. And the story is that the um, entity in England that uh, oversaw the colonies was called the Board of Trades. And the uh, Judiciary Act of 1722 was passed along to the Board of Trades to be presented to the Crown. And the Crown had uh, six months either to approve or reject the act. Um, and at some time well after 1722, um, a, a colonist or representative of Pennsylvania was in the Board of Trades and found a stack of documents all thick and piled with dust. And uh, legal scholars now presume that the um, Act of 1722 was one of the documents uh, hidden in that stack. And because um, the Crown had not ruled on or denied the Act within the elapsed period of time, it was passed into law. And that's kind of the short 
version of that piece of history. Um, so it's from the Act, the Judiciary Act of 1722 that we find ourselves in May of 22 uh, celebrating our 300th anniversary. And um, we lay claim to the oldest continuously operating court in the Western Hemisphere. And from 1722, I hand off the history lesson to <laughs> Terry Sachs. Thank you, Justice. Um, so I'm going to pick up a, a little bit from that point and talk more about how the Supreme Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, helped influence the development of both Pennsylvania and the colonies and country. Um, and in, a, a, as Justice Mundy said, Penn had a, a wonderful utopian vision for what a court system would be. And, and this, the, this is, was very much his personal um, experience, very much his belief. But it's, it's interesting to look back and remember that this is also a business. Penn is a businessman. He, his father was a wealth, was an admiral and a very wealthy man. Uh, the king owed a lot of money to Penn's father and Pennsylvania was the grant, land grant. Uh, to pay off those debts, Penn is the proprietor of Pennsylvania. And that's in a very real sense because he, Penn, of course, wants religious freedom. And he has this great idea for how um, a, you know, a society ruled by law instead of just the power of the king would be a benefit to the people. But he also um, wants this. He wants people to move to Pennsylvania, the big, this big leap to cross the Atlantic and, and bring, come here, bring their families here, bring their business here, bring their money here. This is, this is something that Penn needs to kind of promote to, to succeed. And so this big idea of a very different system of laws was part of that. It kind of not unlike what you might see in, in a modern residential development or uh, one of those uh, places for people over a certain age that you know keep sending me mail. Like, this is how wonderful your life would be. These are the benefits you would have if you come to Pennsylvania and settle down. And so uh, it, it was very sincere and important to him personally, but it was also part of the society that he was hoping to create here. So the idea of this judiciary helped drive people uh, to Pennsylvania. The other reason that this creation was important with, it, with the nation or nation building at that point is just because of Pennsylvania's location as the Keystone State, right in the middle of the uh, Atlantic seaboard colonies, uh, not just the geographic center, but also a center of commerce. It's a transportation hub. It's a busy port city. And so what is happening, it's a political center uh, of the colonies. So what is happening in Pennsylvania is very much known and impacting everything that is happening in the other colonies. There's a lot of talk about what they're trying to build, what these individual entities that each, each uh, area, uh, each colony is trying to create will look like, what might work and what might not work. So ever, there was a lot of attention on what Pennsylvania was doing and it influenced what was happening in uh, the other colonies. Um, the Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme Court, predated the U.S. Supreme Court by almost 70 years. And one of the first appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court was a Pennsylvanian, James Wilson, who is thought to have used the Pennsylvania Supreme Court as a prototype for the, the way the U.S. Supreme Court was structured and how its business was conducted. So in that respect, our Supreme Court had an influence and, and long predated the U.S. Supreme Court, which um, you know, it's easy to forget sometimes. Um, there were a couple of other things that, that were really unique about what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did. Um, Justice Mundy mentioned one of them, circuit riding. Um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and this goes back to the original provincial court. In 1684, that 
was one of the requirements was that the justices go out and ride circuit, to go out to the counties to handle and, 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 and hear all types of matters. And that was, it was important and consistent with Penn's idea that this is the people's law. So, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing the courts to the people. He wanted courts to be more open for people to be able to come in without the formalities of English law and be represented and seen in the courts. And having the, having the justices out and about was part of that. It was also important um, for the development of Pennsylvania that the courts were out there because remarkably enough, this was a contentious time back then in Pennsylvania politics. Um, we, you know, we, we sometimes want to think that the founders were all marching in lockstep you know, developing this wonderful society. But there was a lot of uh, feuding between the Quakers and the Anglicans, and both of them and the Presbyterians. Um, the northern tier of Pennsylvania and, and to the west of the Philadelphia counties, um, there was a lot of strife between what was seen as overrepresentation by Philadelphia in that area in the General Assembly. So there was a, there was a need for people to have uh, a view of the courts, to have the courts come to their town and, um, and see justice in operation and feel that they were being fairly treated. And it also sort of um, helped build relationships between um, the courts and the, the court and the local communities because the court didn't even have a home even in Philadelphia until I think 1707. So when the court was out riding circuit, the court was relying upon the local communities, their public buildings, local lawyers, you know, so hopefully some lawyer who was successful enough to have English law books because there were no American case books or, or published uh, Pennsylvania cases until the late 1700s. So the court was dependent upon and had to work with local communities to bring the justice to the people. So that was sort of another part of developing um, the legal system. Um, another first that was really a Pennsylvania first was the concept of judicial review. Uh, everybody in, in their law school con law class reads Marbury versus Madison as sort of the, the establishment of the um, right of the courts to review legislative enactments to whether, and whether they comply with the Constitution. And that was very much a turning point nationally in, in the federal law, but in Pennsylvania that had happened 10 years earlier. Uh, I think in seven, seven years earlier, there was a case called Hubley's or Hubley's Lessee, I don't know how to pronounce it, where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said this is absolutely something that is the obligation of justices if they're confronted with a law that violates the Constitution to hold it invalid. So uh, in a, a, it, as a statewide development, we were well ahead of the US Supreme Court. Uh, and although that concept was sort of uh, viewed as, as controversial, it was debated over, over the succeeding years, but ultimately uh, even Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice John Bannister Gibson, a, fa a famous, if you've been in the Supreme Court courtroom in Philadelphia, there's a, a portrait and there's a, a white marble bust of him, one of our great justices. But he had a great uh, trepidation about the concept of judicial review and initially uh, thought Marbury versus Madison was uh, was a, a bad decision. He strongly strongly dis excuse me disagreed with it and dissented from a later Pennsylvania case. But 20 years later, even he changed his mind and said he was doing so and explained why he found that judicial review. Um, he, he, he joined the, uh, he joined the uh, majority in, in the later case. So people say that the debate on judicial review on that concept both began and ended here in Pennsylvania. Um, a couple of other firsts that I'll, I'll mention, um, just because, again, because of the age of our court, we, in, in, uh, the first woman, uh, Carrie Burnham Kilgore uh, in 1896 
the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ordered the Philadelphia Prothonotary to allow her to practice law, to admit her to the practice of law. We were one of the first courts to do that. Um, 1961, Ann X. Alpern was the first woman to sit on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. In 1971, uh, Justice Robert N. C. Nix Jr. was the first black justice to sit on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And in 1984, he became the first black chief justice, not only on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, but on any Supreme Court in the country. And uh, in 1988, uh, Justice Juanita Kidd Stout, who was uh, appointed, was the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and the first black woman to sit on any Supreme Court in the country. So there's a, there's a great and uh, an important history that the Supreme Court has brought to Pennsylvania, has impacted uh, both the development of the state, of the colonies, and of the US judicial system. And um, th that probably is about enough history for a Friday morning, but I think you'll hear from our next speakers that Pennsylvania really continues and our Supreme Court continues to be uh, innovative in the types of uh, programs that it has created and supports in um, running the court system, the legal system, and bringing justice to Pennsylvanians. So I will turn this over to our state court administrator, Jeff Walton. Thank you, and uh, thanks to everybody here for, for having us. Um, wonderful hospitality. I don't know, I, just as an aside, uh, does, does President Judge Wheeler allow lawyers to have notes in the, uh, in the courtroom? I don't know. I, that, that, that set of introductions was, was quite impressive and, frankly, intimidating. But uh, yeah. th thank you very much for, for having us. We're going to jump, I guess, to 1968, which I think is really reflects the beginning of the modern Supreme Court. As you know, in 1968, uh, there was a constitutional convention which focused on the judiciary and adopted the current version of Article 5 of the Constitution, which created and purports to create a unified judicial system in Pennsylvania. And uh, um, this is sort of in the, uh, unif we're in the unified but not unified system, actually. Uh, but ultimately, that gave the Supreme Court uh, the responsibility of, for uh, the general supervisory and administrative authority over all the courts uh, in, in the Commonwealth. And, and AOPC, the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts, uh, was established in the Constitution, or at least my position was established in the Constitution, um, to uh, to help the court with that administrative responsibility. I will say, again, as an aside, uh, when I was offered the job by the court, my wife uh, said, court administrator, what's that? And I said, oh, honey, we, I am, my position's enshrined in Article 5 of the Constitution. And she said, oh, that's nice. Um, but <laughs> I don't think she was impressed. Um, but one of the things I think that, that justices find uh, when they get to the court is that the the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania has a set of responsibilities, in addition to deciding the most important cases in Pennsylvania, a set of responsibilities that are vast in terms of their administrative oversight of the court system. Uh, I, I don't know what percentage of time they have to sp they spend on administrative matters, but it's not small. Uh, they do have help, and they have help in a couple of respects. We'll come back to AOPC. One of the ways that they have help is through two, their, their boards and committees system. Um, so, as you know, there are seven procedural rules committees uh, and one evidentiary rules committee covering all the different aspects of the law. The court appoints folks from all over the Commonwealth to those rules committees. Uh, they make proposals to the court for rules changes. Sometimes those recommendations come from practicing lawyers, sometimes from judges, sometimes from the court down to the rules committees. I know Judge Reppert is on the disciplinary board um, uh, here from Tioga County. The court works hard to have, um, have a lot of diversity on these on these boards, including geographic diversity. The perspective of a small county uh, bar is different from a big county bar, and having them on the boards, I think, makes a lot of difference. Um, in addition to those rules committees, the court has, uh, has Supreme Court boards. Uh, the Board of Law Examiners, which regulates the, on behalf of the court, the practice of law, or the uh, admission of bar members to the law, of people to the bar. Uh, there's the disciplinary board, which deals with the other end of the line, the lawyers who are admitted who have difficulty. There's a continuing legal education board, which oversees uh, CLE programs like this one. Um, the uh, IOLTA board, which with both money from the General Assembly uh, and from lawyers, uh, provides the bulk of civil legal aid money in the Commonwealth. Um, and also the Lawyers Fund for Client Security. 
uh, which compensates clients who have been defrauded by their lawyers. I will say, when I first started uh, in Terry's job in, in, in uh, 2018, um, I had no idea where my $275 fee went. And to learn that that money supports the work of these boards, and particularly the Client Security Fund Board, that is to compensate lawyers who've been defrauded by the bad folks amongst us, was really, uh, w was a wonderful thing to, to learn. And um, so I, I, I used to always write the check, and now I write the check, and I'm happy to know where the money goes. Um, I, I'll spend a little bit of time now talking about, uh, about AOPC. Um, we are essentially the, the sort of the back office for, uh, for the judicial system. Um, but as, and on the unified, not unified front, um, we are not really a unified judiciary. The bulk of the budget, the bulk of the work gets done at the county level. We do have a sizable operation. We have, uh, you know, we support about 1,000 judges. Uh, we have 200, roughly 200 state level employees who work in the county courts and the appellate courts. Um, and we have about 300 staff at AOPC, the bulk of which are IT folks that support our statewide case management systems. Um, we have, on the state level employee front, we have uh, you know, places like Philadelphia, which might have about 100 judges, and, uh, and we have there 13 state level employees. Here, here in Tioga County, we have the president judge, who I know has a tough job managing all the other common police court judges here in the county. Um, and we have two state level employees. Uh, you know, Randy Bob and uh, Jade Holdren are two state level employees. Everybody else in the courthouse is a county employee. Um, so while we have a, a unified judicial system, this is a county courthouse, the MDJ offices are county leased buildings, uh, offices, uh, the employees here are, are county based. The, the, Computers are county-based, so we aren't really completely uh, unified. Um, we do, one of the things we do at AOPC is we do provide statewide case management systems. That's a big chunk of what we do, the Common Pleas case management system, the MDJ case management system, and the, uh, and the appellate court case management system all operated out of, um, out of, uh, <coughs> out of uh, AOPC. We also have the guardianship tracking system. Uh, which was, you may remember back in 2014, the court had an elder justice task force which made a host of recommendations designed to protect uh, elder Pennsylvanians. Um, and then one of the recommendations was to have a, a, a tracking system which we have had in place since 2018, which, is, which streamlines all the guardianship reporting. But more importantly, or as importantly, it has a red flag system, which has literally saved lives. We find out that a, a guardian is not filing reports. The judge can then, if this happened in Luzerne County, uh, can go and, and ask uh, local law enforcement to find, find the person who's, who's being uh, um, supervised. Uh, there, if somebody was found to be homeless, the guardian had abandoned, which was a sister, had abandoned the person, saved his life. Uh, when a guardian is accused of stealing money, from someone in one county, it immediately goes out to all the counties. So every judge knows to look out for that, uh, for that uh, problem uh, guardian. So we do a lot at the state level, but a lot of it, what we do is, is support uh, at the local level. We are principally our best practices guidance organization, but we do have several significant state level programs. President Judge Wheeler mentioned a couple of them, and, and we have, we're happy to have uh, Justice Dougherty here who can talk about two of them that are near and dear to his heart. One is our, our uh, Office of Children and Families in the Courts, which sponsor the roundtable programs and, and the Autism Initiative. So maybe we can have Justice Dougherty talk about those two programs. We have a lot of others, but, but he's, he's the lead on those. All right, first and foremost, thank you. And to our President Judge, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. As a former trial judge and an administrator of a trial court, I have to tell you, it, people may think our job's easy, but it's really not. So for you to be here and spend time with us, is I, I truly appreciate that. As to my colleague, Justice Mundy, I want you guys to know that the, anybody who lives in a rural environment knows or should know that Justice Mundy is a constant sound for you and a constant voice within the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And we're here as a result of her request that we need to, this program, which was only available to the Philadelphians, needed to be brought back to her home in Tioga. So I appreciate her for uh, inviting me. And, as you know, I'm from Philadelphia, so I've, I feel like the fresh air kid. I'm coming out of the big city, and I'm up here, and I'm walking down the street, 
everybody's saying, do you want to ride to the courthouse? And I'm only at the Penwells. And I said, no, I want to walk because to me, this is like, it's a wonderful life. And, and to top it off, it starts snowing as I walk into the courthouse. So I have to tell you, it, it leaves a really nice impression. What I'm here to tell you is I want to give you a peek behind the curtain of the Supreme Court. We're talking a lot of law, we're talking a lot of history, and we're talking the Constitution. I just want to bring it home and make it practical as to tell you what it means. In our Constitution, we, it specifically says that the power of the Supreme Court is to be the administrative arm as well as the supervisory arm of all courts. So that means we control everything. So when you're electing a Supreme Court justice, you better realize the type of woman or man that you're putting on that court, and you want to find out what kind of heart do they have because it's going to affect each and every one of us. We have 13 million Pennsylvanians. And our decisions and our actions will have an impact or implicate each and every one of us. I always told people that I was a lawyer that became lucky enough to have an opportunity to run for the bench. And then I was blessed to be in leadership where we're able to take all the things we want to do that are good and do it. And we have that, we have that bully pulpit. I'm also a lifelong Pennsylvanian. I understand that we all work and we all pay taxes. And we always get frustrated as to where are our taxes going. Well, I gotta tell you, a lot of those taxes are paying for the state court system. I think we have an obligation and a duty to make sure that we use taxpayer dollars respectfully and wisely. And if we have an opportunity to save the taxpayer money, that's incumbent upon us. Now, this is completely separate from our jurisprudential arm, or what we're supposed to do. I always joke, I'll never have a, a marble bust in Philadelphia. But if I leave an imprint of maybe having an easier, better, more fair system for Pennsylvanians, that's all I need. I don't need my image. I just want to know that when I pass and I go upstairs to the big guy, I can say, hey, we did something good on this court. And I believe the two programs that I'm involved with are really doing good. One's called the Office of Children and Family in the Courts. It's dealing with everything child welfare. As practicing lawyers, no one ever really wanted to do family law, child welfare law, deal with dependency or neglect. It was always like the stepchild of our, our, of our system. And that always offended me. So when I became a judge, I specifically asked to go to our, the Philadelphia Family Court. Each day, every day, I get to see the worst that life has to offer our children and families. Well, you know what? Each day, every day, what's happening in my courtroom in Philadelphia is happening in the, this courtroom or any courtroom across the Commonwealth. The same issues. We're plagued by mental health, drug addiction, poverty, crime. But people don't realize that child welfare is one of the few systems that touch all that. Because, you know, the guy that gets arrested and he goes to jail and he may be the sole support for his family, no money's coming in. The next thing you know, they lose their home. Mom is depressed. Kids aren't going to school. They're in the dependency system now. Children and youth is coming in. Now, think of it. Children and youth, child dependency, child welfare. That is government intrusion into the family. People don't realize how serious that is. They have an opportunity to come through your door and stay there till your child turns 18. I think that's an awesome amount of power for government, and I kind of want it curtailed, personally. But we have to do it within the law. By creating this Office of Children and Family in the Courts, we're creating a uniformed system throughout the state, despite the fact that we're really a county-based court system. Tioga does its own practices differently than, say, Monroe County or uh, Lycoming County. But when we have the end result, we want a just result. And that's what the OCFC, that's what we call it, OCFC, that's what we're doing. What we've created is roundtables, regional roundtables, where we're bringing all our system partners and stakeholders together. And we're having open dialogue as to how best can we make the system work. I was speaking the other day in Snyder County, and I made a comment. I said, you know how many times have people heard the system failed, the system failed? Ladies and gents, we are the system. We are the system. So when they say the system fails, that is almost like, a, to me, it's a smack at us. And I, I'm offended at that because I know that we have really good people and we're really trying to make the system work. It's not the system failed. It's that we're not communicating correctly. And we're not communicating with our system partners because we want to live in these silos. We know that. So the concept of the Office of Children and Family of the Court is to break down those silos, meet 
Let's discuss it with the public defenders, the child welfare, the mental health experts. How can I reunify that family or create a new family? How can I save the taxpayer dollar? Because if I can get mom back into the home, then our taxpayer dollar is not going to spend $155 a day for the five kids that I've just taken and placed in foster care, and they're going to age out in foster care. Now imagine the kind of money that we're spending because we don't talk. And yet people often look and, and criticize and go, oh, child welfare, Oy, ch children and youth. You have to understand, this is us protecting us. And while I have a constitutional, we have a constitutional duty and responsibility, I find it incumbent upon me personally um, that I, I, this is, this is a, a, a I, I, to me it's more of a passion, to me it's more of a mission that I have this opportunity. I sit in a borrowed chair. I could be, I could lose an election. But why I sit in this borrowed chair, I want to try to do as much good as we possibly can. Which brings me to my secondary issue, autism in the courts. Now, I'm kind of like the guy that brings the, the, I want to say, I'd like to say, we bring the human touch to the judiciary. I'm just not all about books and law, I'm about reality and how do these books and laws uh, uh, affect the people who walk through our courtroom, unlike us. You guys are the voices. You speak for everybody who doesn't have a voice. And we as the judges are only as good as the information we get, and you guys are the deliverer of those messages. The problem is there's a whole element of and, and class of people who are on the spectrum, and we're unaware of it. As I, I spoke about this yesterday as well. When I was growing up, and I'm only 60, when I was growing up, I didn't know anybody with autism. I never heard of it. It seems like now you can't meet someone who doesn't have a family member or, or a friend that's on the spectrum. I'm sure it existed. I was just ignorant to it. And as I often tell people, it was a personal experience with me that brought me into this realm. I was a judge in a courtroom, and it was a juvenile delinquency case. I had just convicted the kid of a felony. Now the process is in del de delinquency, do I judge him delinquent? because he needs supervision, rehabilitation, and treatment. Well, as I'm speaking to the kid, he's not looking at me, he's fidgeting, he's turning his back, and I'm saying, son, look at me, look at me. And I'm thinking, these are all the classic signs of incorrigibility and that this kid needs treatment. The mom pulls me aside and says, can I talk to you on the side, judge? I go to the side, she said, my child's on the spectrum. And I had to lean over and go, what does that mean? Guess what? I was embarrassed and humiliated. Here I thought I was somewhat knowledgeable, and I didn't even understand it. So I come from this world where self-education will lead to self-reform. Self-reform will lead to judicial reform. And it worked for me. I had the blessing of being the head of Philadelphia's family court where we had 24 judges, two courthouses, and 800 employees. So my mission was, I'm going to educate them all. So we brought the experts in and we educate them just so that you could be aware of. I'm not using this as a shield, nor am I going to use it as a sword. sword. I just want I believe we as jurists and those who participate in our system need to have a better understanding that if we're going to be a just society and if we're going to dispense justice, I think it's incumbent that we understand who's before us. If I have a child or an adult standing in front of a, whether it's an orphan's court case, a criminal case, a civil case, and they ha kind of have a meltdown, I may say, okay, let's order a diagnosis. I'm ordering a psychiatric. It comes back with an access diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I know that I could give the child, order some psychotropic medication, and everything could be okay. But you know what? How about those people that have come into our courtroom and they're diagnosed or not diagnosed with on, as being on the spectrum? What is the test? Is there a medicine? Is a, what, what do I do? I didn't, I didn't know what to do. We did a listening tour during COVID. And we did regional roundtables, again, I call them the listening tour regionally, just to hear from the different parts of Pennsylvania, what are we doing? What do we know? How are you handling this? When we took a poll of all the child welfare judges in Pennsylvania, 84% said they've dealt with people in their courtroom that they believed were on the spectrum. 84%. When I asked them what did they do about it, we didn't get much of a response. Judge Minor from Potter was is part of that uh, task force, and he was out there when we were amazed that we're having this prevalence in our courthouse, yet how we don't know how to handle it. And then I sit back and think, 
you know what, I'll leave. And I, I, at night I'm thinking, did I just terminate a mother because she's on the spectrum? Did I remove a child and give that child a permanent record because she's on the spectrum because of my ignorance? And I'm supposed to call myself a good judge? So all I want to do is take this understanding and educate the Commonwealth uh, so that people have an awareness. I also have tried to share with judges many times we have our schedule. We have our jobs to do. If someone on the spectrum has a, a, a say, a TSS worker or an assistant or a, someone to assist them, many times they're not permitted into the courtroom. Why? Because the court officer or the court crier won't allow them because they're not on the list and they want to expedite the case. Sometimes it happens. It happened in Philadelphia quite a bit. And then what happens is I'm not getting the full information that I need. As I said, I'm only as good as the information I get. And then when I don't do the right thing and that family feels rejected and not hurt, they have the impression that the court failed, that the system failed. When we didn't fail, we just didn't know. So I think if we just get the word out, um, that's the best we can do. And I believe by educating all our stakeholders and system partners, we're, we are meeting our duty and responsibility under the Constitution. And that's about it. It's just that I hope uh, that these programs work, that we become a little more sensitive, and we have a little more understanding and empathy when we as the leaders of the court are working with our brothers, sister judges, and all our system partners. Uh, it's a collective we, not a me. Well, th thank you very much, Justice. Well, there's, there's a lot more to be said about, about the administrative responsibilities, sort of statewide programs. I know we're going to have time for questions at the end. Um, and if we can come back to some of these, some of these issues, some other things we do. I know we have, we have wonderful uh, veterans and other specialty courts we might want to talk about, but I do want to turn things back over to Terry Sachs to come to the, to, to back to the law, uh, back to the, <laughs> to the, to the to jurisprudential component right. of what these folks do, because we do, they do, do, they decide important <laughs> cases, and I think it's interesting to hear about how they do that and, and uh, how that right. works. So I'm going to turn it back to Terry to talk to the, our, our two folks down at the end here. Well. Um, thank you, Jeff. And I, I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions, and I'm going to start with Justice Saylor and Justice Brobson, but all justices should, should feel free to jump in on this. Um, the first question that I want to ask Justice Saylor, who is, is a real expert in this area, is about the importance of state constitutions and state constitutional law and the ways in which state and federal constitutions differ because state constitutional law is uh, assuming uh, a larger role in, in case considerations. Mm -hmm. So Justice Saylor, uh, can you speak to that please? Yeah, well let me just say a few brief things and. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, Justice Robson's thoughts, but I'll talk briefly about the difference between the federal constitution, with which we're all familiar, and state constitutions. Uh, the federal constitution uh, adopted in 17, well, let me say first, that state constitutions, as you've heard a little bit of this, predated the federal constitution. So most of the original 13 colonies became states had their own constitutions. Pennsylvania's first constitution was adopted in 1776, the year that the Declaration of Independence was written. Uh, of course, we had the Federal Constitutional Convention in 1787. Can you bring that mic just a little closer? Yeah. Had the Federal Convention in 1787, and uh, that was the adoption of the Federal Charter. The Federal Constitution's uh, fairly short, uh, it's essentially a, a structural document. It creates the three branches, the three major departments of government, and assigns them their powers and responsibilities. State constitutions, on the other hand, uh, uh, have to deal of necessity with the governance of that jurisdiction. So they include provisions that the federal charter does not include. So state constitutions typically deal with things like education, with elections, with taxation, finance, 
with local government, with corporations. And uh, so they're uh, more expansive documents, but as I said, they have to actually deal with not only creating the structure of that government, but with actually making the uh, government work on a statewide basis. Another difference I'd like to point out between uh, most state constitutions and the federal constitution, particularly the constitutions of the original 13 states. Uh, you know that the, uh, shortly after the federal constitution was passed, it was amended. The first 10 amendments carry the name the Bill of Rights. But if you actually look at these rights that are expressed in the, uh, say, pick, uh, pick the First Amendment. Uh, they're really stated not as positive rights, but as a, a restraint on legislative power. So Article One, we'll talk about freedom of uh, speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. But actually, Article One of the National Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise. Congress will make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So they're stated in the negative, whereas in the Pennsylvania Constitution, starting with the original one in 1776, and continuing through all five iterations, embedded at the beginning of the Constitution is a Declaration of Rights. And that, unlike the National Charter, or the First Amendment, the amendments, uh, expresses these rights as the positive, inherent rights of free men and women. So to pick an article, Section 7 of Pennsylvania's Declaration of Rights, freedom of press and speech, says the free communications of thoughts and opinions is one of the invaluable rights of men. Uh, the right of petition, the citizen shall have a right in, to, in a peaceable manner to assemble for the common good. So I think that's a difference between the, uh, uh, the state and federal constitutions. Uh, the final difference is state constitutions are somewhat easier to amend in most states than the federal constitution, which has uh, been amended, but it's much more static and uh, very difficult to amend. But, uh, and that's not all bad. The state constitutions can be periodically looked at and adjusted to reflect changes that occur over time. Uh, and as I said, Pennsylvania is, has a long history, but its constitution has, uh, uh, undergone five major iterations. Uh, but there's also uh, the ability, uh, in, uh, other than having a constitutional convention and looking at the document as a whole, to uh, amend it periodically by passage of a resolution in two sessions of the legislature and then a submission to the people. And I think that Justice Brobson has some thoughts about the recent trend to uh, employ the amendment process uh, to change uh, the Constitution, uh, which I think we've seen in recent years, uh, to reflect a dislike of a particular court opinion. I think that was my cue. Um, uh, first, uh, thanks, Chief. Um, you know, uh, Justice Doherty, um, uh, said it well, uh, this is a wonderful town, a wonderful community. Growing up in Lycoming County, I, I spent a little bit of time up here north of 15. Uh, tried to date a girl from Tioga County, it didn't go well for me. Um, very demanding standards up here. Um, but, uh, but really enjoy the opportunity. I was up here when I ran uh, in 2021 for Supreme Court, spent some time along here. I tell, I tell my friends in, in, in the Democratic Party that when you're running statewide as a Republican, you have to go to all 67 counties. When you're running as a Democrat, you have to go to seven. Um, so I was happy, happy to get up here um, and see all that they this place has to offer the people of Pennsylvania. 
Um, I, I was also struck, so there's, I'm sitting next to, to two fantastic jurists, and, uh, and, and I, I enjoy listening to them speak uh, for two completely different reasons. One, you know, Chief Justice Saylor has, has, has uh, idol's probably too strong of a word, um, but, but certainly a mentor of mine uh, since I was even in private practice. Um, we go back a fairly long way. My wife actually worked on his campaign uh, for, for Supreme Court. Um, and we got to know each other then. Um, but he's one of those people, if you ever had the opportunity to, to hear him speak so eloquently about the history of Pennsylvania and, and just the practice of judging and the state versus the federal constitution, he's one of those people, if you've ever met in your life, that you just want to lean in. You, know, you just want to lean in and capture and hear everything that he has to say. And I'm, very, I'm, I'm so honored that I was able to, uh, to uh, succeed him uh, on the court, never, of course, fill his shoes, but succeed him. Uh, and also have the benefit of his wisdom uh, while he's still while he's still with us before he heads down to warmer weather for a few months. Um, <laughs> but it's great. Um, and and Justice Doherty, um, what I enjoy about uh, working with him and, and watching him in his judicial career is just his passion, which I'm I'm sure you got. Um, the one thing that, you know, certainly my family originates, my father was born in Philadelphia, so we still have family down in Philadelphia. We share that a little bit. Um, but don't let the Philadelphia accent fool you. He is a justice uh, for the people of Pennsylvania. I don't know of too many justices that I have been familiar with that have traveled around Pennsylvania as much as Justice Doherty, um, representing the people that, uh, understanding that he represents the people uh, that elected him certainly, and the people, and all the people of Pennsylvania, but really represents justice for all. And a lot of the lessons that he learned uh, on the court in Philadelphia, as the administrative judge in the family court, are lessons that translate well even to counties like Lycoming County or Dauphin County or Tioga County. He dealt with a volume of cases, but the cases that he dealt with are cases that all of the county judges deal with throughout Pennsylvania. So for him to bring that experience across the state the way that he does. Um, is certainly an asset on our Supreme Court and something that I, uh, I look forward to watching him continue to do and learn from him um, as what I affectionately refer to myself as the new guy um, on the court. Um, and then, of course, Justice Mundy, who I ran with in 2009 uh, when she ran for Superior Court and I ran for Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, has been a friend for a long time. And again, uh, you know, some, some people ask me about well, you know, Justice Brobson, now that you've run for Commonwealth Court and you've run for Supreme Court, how do you think about electing our judges in Pennsylvania versus merit selection? Um, I'm not so sure I would be on the Supreme Court right now if there were merit selection. Um, but, but, uh, but the great thing about the voters of Pennsylvania that I have learned is they usually get it right. And the fact that um, they saw fit to elevate Justice Mundy uh, from, uh, from Tioga County uh, from the Superior Court to the Supreme Court speaks volumes to the, just, to the people of Pennsylvania getting it right. Um, I've, I've enjoyed her friendship, I've enjoyed working for her, and I'm grateful that she drafted me to come up uh, to Tioga County to be with you all today. Um, you know, this is really a very interesting time uh, to come on to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Um, I spent my entire legal career uh, basically working and representing people who had to deal with government. Um, uh, whether government was affecting their property rights or government was affecting um, their ability to do their job. Uh, you know, this is, this is something that I have been passionate about my entire career. You know, I've always felt that, uh, you know, government really wants the people of Pennsylvania to follow the law, and it should be no different that the people of Pennsylvania should expect government to follow the law. And that's why um, I was, I was, Rarely ever did I think about running for judge, but when I had the opportunity to run for the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania in 2009, uh, I certainly jumped at the opportunity. Um, uh, we talked, the, the Chief Justice talked briefly about um, how the Constitution of Pennsylvania has been amended or had five iterations. One of those iterations is the Constitution of Convention of 1968. And in that, during that Constitution, they created the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, which is the court that I sat on, uh, which just recently celebrated its 50th anniversary, not nearly as old as the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, but still an anniversary uh, worth celebrating. Um, the Commonwealth Court was created in 1968. There's sort of an official story and then there's an unofficial story. Uh, the official story uh, is that the Pennsylvania Superior Court, itself an old appellate court uh, in, in the country, uh, was perceived to be too busy, very busy. And rather than simply expanding the number of judges on that court, uh, the, the Constitutional Convention suggestion was we should just create another appellate court and we'll leave it to the General Assembly to decide what their jurisdiction should be. 
And lo and behold, what the General Assembly ended up doing was basically saying, well, we're going to create this, we're, we're taking this Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, it's going to have original trial court jurisdiction and appellate court jurisdiction, and it's basically going to handle everything government. So this is going to be the court that you're going to go to as a trial court if you want to challenge state government action, if you want to actually lodge a lawsuit against state government. But we're also going to make it an appellate court so it hears uh, appeals from our common pleas courts and state administrative agencies, uh, which our Constitution actually provides for. Our Constitution provides for a right of appeal from state administrative agency actions uh, and also from a court of record to a court not of record. So at the time uh, before the Commonwealth Court was created, those decisions, those appeals from state administrative agencies, and I'm talking about the insurance department, the health department, um, a, lot of, a lot of agencies on the executive branch that can wield a lot of power in affecting most, all people of Pennsylvania, those appeals were going to the Court of Common Pleas in Dauphin County. So that jurisdiction was picked up. The Commonwealth Court was created, and the first president judge of the Commonwealth Court was, was James Bowman, who was then uh, the judge of the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas. So that's the official uh, story. Uh, the unofficial story is uh, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, a lot of the industry and power and money in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was focused in the southeast part of the state. Uh, so a lot of the power people in the southeast part of the state uh, didn't understand why when they wanted to appeal state government action, they had to go to a judge in Dauphin County who was elected by the people of Dauphin County that they couldn't participate in helping to elect or select or what have you. So, so the unofficial story, um, don't tell anybody, this isn't being recorded, is it? Um, the unofficial story is that it was that idea that these issues that are, that are decided by our state administrative agencies in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania have such an impact on business and on employment, how we educate our children, how we care for our elderly, how we protect our historic and natural resources, and yes, how we elect our public officials, shouldn't be decided by a common police court of one county, but should be decided as a court as a whole. So that's the unofficial reason or unofficial way that the Commonwealth Court came about. Um, I think it's very interesting difference between our, our, our Pennsylvania Constitution and the National Constitution in this regard. Um, Chief Justice Saylor pointed this out. Um, the National Constitution, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, he's much more the historian than I am, um, but the National Constitution actually creates one court, uh, the United States Supreme Court, and then such inferior courts as Congress shall establish. The Pennsylvania Constitution is different. Under Article 5, the Pennsylvania Constitution creates every court in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Supreme, the Superior, now it makes the Supreme Court obviously, as Justice Doherty pointed out, uh, the chief uh, administrative arm of the courts uh, that control the judiciary in Pennsylvania. Uh, but it also, cre Article 5 also creates the Superior Court, uh, our, our very busy intermediate appellate court in, Korea, in Pennsylvania, as well as the Commonwealth Court from the 1968 Constitutional Convention, as well as our magisterial district courts and municipal courts and common pleas courts. Uh, it even creates the Court of Judicial Discipline in Pennsylvania, which hears uh, cases brought against uh, judges who are alleged to behave badly. Um, nobody in this room, by the way. Um, but, uh, but that, I think, is a very interesting point uh, to dovetail with what Chief Justice Saylor said, uh, that, that, the state con that, the, that the national constitution is really sort of this framework document, but the detail uh, of the state constitution is, a, is an excellent contrast to that. Um, the, the chief did mention also the constitutional amendment phenomenon. Um, you know, it's certainly something that I saw doing administrative practice and coming up through administrative practice in Harrisburg and then on the Commonwealth Court, um, the, the sort of the increased tension in the separation of powers when the, when the legislative branch doesn't work with the executive branch or vice versa, uh, there's always an effort to try and get around that. We've seen it uh, in, at the national level too, um, but, but back in the say, I want to say the early 2000s, I saw it in administrative practice where, where, um, where state executive agencies or administrative agencies were issuing these things called statements of policy. Now, statements of policy have been around for a long time. The idea of a statement of policy being they don't have to be promulgated, they don't have to be published, they don't have to be formally passed, they're actually not laws. The precedent of Pennsylvania establishes generally that statements of policy really aren't worth the paper that they're written on. But administrative agencies unable to, uh, running into roadblocks, and executive branch officials running into roadblocks with the legislature would look at these statements of policy as sort of this alternative way of augmenting uh, areas of the law that they felt were somewhat deficient or interpreting them in a way that they felt were uh, deficient. 
Um, and, and, and a lot of these statement of policies started getting issued very frequently, and we saw sort of an uptick in litigation challenging these statements of policy, saying, well, they're not really statements of policy. This is actually unpromulgated regulations, not going through the formal process that we have in Pennsylvania, publishing regulations, being challenged, being vetted with comments by the General Assembly and the legislature. Uh, so, so we saw that happening sort of in the, in the 2000s. Um, I see the constitutional amendment process as sort of the flip side to that, um, where, where it certainly is a power that the General Assembly has. Nobody can dispute that if the General Assembly wanted to amend the Constitution to include substantive legal provisions that we are generally used to seeing in statutes, they certainly can put those amendments uh, to the people of Pennsylvania. Um, what, what the motivation, though, the idea that, that we're going to go through constitutional amendment because we can't get the other branch of government uh, to agree with the legislation that we're passing, um, that's where I think people are kind of struggling with it a little bit out there, at least that I have seen. Um, you know, th there's certainly nothing wrong with, uh, again, exercising the constitutional amendment power. But when you take substantive power or substantive legislation and take it away from, a, from the representative democracy that we have built into our system with our state legislature, you essentially become a direct democracy where the people of Pennsylvania are deciding these issues. And then you get into questions about, well, are they deciding them with all of the information that they would need? Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a bill uh, drafted by the General Assembly in Pennsylvania, but it doesn't fit neatly on a ballot. Um, but these constitutional amendments can be worded in a way uh, that, that they're just open-ended uh, questions of general nature, and we certainly wouldn't want our elected state officials to be just deciding, passing laws that say, yeah, this is the law and someone else will fill in the gap later. So there's a lot of pitfalls associated with that, um, and there's certainly the challenges that we have to address in the court and that the court has addressed it in the past, about whether the process being followed is the appropriate process. Uh, there's certainly provisions in the Pennsylvania Constitution that are fairly robust in how the Constitution has to be amended in terms of publication, how many issues can be in particular amendments. And I think in, in history has told us that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has done uh, a yeoman's job of trying to uh, deal with those thorny issues that come up, which, which people tend to see as political, and they certainly can be. Um, but that's what the Supreme Court is there to decide and to enforce the Constitution, as Terry Sachs said, the idea of judicial review. That extends also to the power, the exercise of the power of the General Assembly uh, to go directly to the people through the constitutional amendment process. Yeah, well, speak on. Uh, no, go ahead, Chief. I'm sorry. One of the, uh, just to finish up on the 68 Constitution, when, as Jeff Bolton said, was focused primarily on the judicial article, the judiciary, spent a lot of time, a lot of thoughtful people, but they modified the, uh, the, the way you select judges, and that's still the system 60 years later. They uh, kept the notion of a, or created the notion of a partisan political election the first time you ran, but they then gave judges supposedly the benefit of a, a retention arrangement after 10 years on the bench, and that aspirationally was supposed to be nonpartisan, but in this day and age, I'm not quite so sure about that. But I, I bring that up, uh, and, and a fair number of states, surprisingly, still elect their judges, unlike the federal system, uh, actually a fair amount, uh, at least in the first instance. But I, I do think that uh, uh, in a system that has elective judges, and you can, you know, as Justice Robson said, debate the best system. Certainly, uh, you know, the federal government has an appointive system subject to confirmation, but as we all know, that's replete with politics also. So I'm not sure that running for judge is any more or less political than securing a federal appointment. But uh, I do think that an important thing is, and it's illustrated by the fact that we're here today uh, with all of you, I'm from Somerset County. I started out there. I spent some time practicing. Uh, Justice Robson's from Lycoming County. Uh, Somerset County is a six-class county. It reminds me very much of uh, Tioga County. So this is like coming home for me. But I think you're very fortunate to have a, a justice on the Supreme Court from your county. Because I think when you have a diverse state like Pennsylvania, 
spread across 67 counties that differ tremendously geographically uh, in terms of their composition. We have 67, or 60 judicial districts of all different sizes. Uh, like anything else, geographic diversity is good because it brings people to the court from different areas of the state. And uh, our big cities are important, and Justice Doctor is from Philadelphia, but it's nice to have uh, a justice from uh, uh, a six-class county on the northern tier. And, and it, because uh, each person that comes to the court uh, brings their own, their own perspective, their life experiences, their background, uh, that's not to say that they that influences the decision, but it's just that they, that, that's part of who they are. Like Justice Doherty spent a lot of years in family court. He brings that experience to the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Mondi uh, comes to the court uh, with the uh, background, the experience of having lived and worked and raised her family in a smaller area. So I think that's uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, very beneficial uh, on a statewide court where judges come to the court through the electoral process. Um, Justice Saylor, I have another question for you since we uh, have the benefit of, of you here. Uh, Justice Robson mentioned thorny questions. So uh, this week, the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral argument in a case called Moore versus Harper. Uh, involving something called the independent legislature doctrine. And that's something that there's been, you know, a lot of heat but not a lot of light, I think, on the, on the topic. I know you are an expert in that area, so could you offer some comments on it? Well, I'm certainly not an expert, but it is an interesting case. But, but let me uh, preface that by saying, as uh, everyone I think knows, it, it is uh, an interesting time to be on a state Supreme Court. I'm retired now, my colleagues are still there. There's a lot of focus, and there will be continuing focus on the role of state courts and state constitutions in our federal system. And I use examples like voting rights, abortion. A lot of this is now falling back to the states to adjudicate by reference to first their legislatures, their governor, and ultimately perhaps their court acting pursuant to the state constitution, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, but in this particular area, uh, this was an interesting case. It was argued for three hours two days ago. But uh, uh, to make it real simple, or as simple as I can, and the case comes out of North Carolina, it involves congressional redistricting, which Pennsylvania's had to deal with every 10 years, just went through that. But, but the, the, in, in North Carolina, uh, there was an allegation that uh, what the legislature did in terms of apportioning the congressional seats in North Carolina was a partisan gerrymander. Well, we know that the U.S. Supreme Court in Rucho several years ago said, look, we're done with this notion of partisan gerrymandering. We've struggled for 40 years. We, we know it's no good. We know it's not good for democracy. Uh, we know it's always existed but we're, we're, we're not gonna deal with it because it's, it's a non-justiciable political question. We simply can't come up with a test that makes sense. Uh, so we have no judicially manageable standard. And, uh, and, and Chief Justice Roberts said, but, but don't worry, because you know the states can deal with it. They'll deal with it in their legislatures, perhaps by reference to their constitutions. And uh, so you, you don't need to worry. Well, fast forward, this case comes out in North Carolina, but the argument that's made in the case, and it's a very interesting article, it's, it's grounded in the Elections Clause of the United States Constitution, Article One, which says, uh, which says that, the, it, call it the time, manner, the Elections Clause. It says the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. So the argument at base is that only the legislature of a state can apportion federal seats, i.e. congressional seats, and that there's no role under a literal reading of the elections clause for state courts 
even acting pursuant to provisions of their state constitutions. And uh, depending on what the court uh, does with that case, it would, uh, it would if, if they were to adopt the theory of the North Carolina appellants, uh, essentially read out uh, state courts and state constitutions from having anything to do with congressional uh, reapportionment. It, it really uh, has been around for a while. It, it, it has its roots in a concurring opinion in the 2000 case of Bush versus Gore, you will remember that, which resolved that presidential election. And in that concurring opinion, then Chief Justice Rehnquist, joined by uh, Justice, uh, uh, former Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, uh, uh, faulted the, the Florida court for acting uh, under their constitution and cited the elections clause. So it's a very, very important case uh, for a lot of reasons. It attracted uh, a multitude of amicus briefs from both sides of the issue and from very able legal scholars. Uh, uh, it attracted a brief from the Conference of Chief Justices, which was mentioned during the or oral argument Wednesday. So. Uh, we'll see how it comes out, but uh, of all the cases that come, you know, that, that are heard by the Supreme Court, I think this is uh, very interesting as a matter of not only federal constitutional interpretation, but the, uh, its effect on the federalist system that we have, and its particular effect on the, uh, the role of state courts acting pursuant to their independent state charter which created that legislature. Um, Justice Brobson, we, we talked a little bit about state courts and, and Justice Saylor just mentioned it again as the expositors of the state constitutions. But obviously state Supreme Courts are also the ultimate uh, voice on interpretation of statutes and that's something that you uh, have a lot of experience with both in your, your prior life on the Commonwealth Court and now on this court. Um, so, do you have any comments on the issue of statutory interpretation and the court's role? <clears throat> Maybe. Um, no. Um, well, I do think it's, again, a, a, a contrast between, you know, federal courts and how they interpret federal statutes versus the state courts and how we interpret state statutes. Um, the, the, the federal standard, and again, I'm glad the chief is here and he can correct me if I'm wrong, is essentially a common law standard. Uh, so, so, so the common law has developed on how they're going to approach to interpret uh, or construct whichever word you want to apply. And there's some academic debate now, right now uh, about whether uh, statutory interpretation and statutory construction are actually the same thing. <laughs> I won't go into that. Um, but, uh, but we actually have been told uh, by the General Assembly and, and by the Governor uh, uh, under the Statutory Construction Act about how we are to interpret uh, acts of the legislature and, and, and have extended that principle of the Statutory Construction Act uh, as a principle that we apply in interpreting even things beyond what the General Assembly might do, but to local land use and zoning ordinances, uh, even constitutional provisions, we will, we will employ uh, the principles set forth in the Statutory Construction Act. Um, and dare I say, sometimes we actually use those principles when we interpret our own rules, uh, civil rules or criminal rules or procedural rules. But the Statutory Construction Act is, a fairly, is fairly straightforward in the sense that the, the rule of thumb, which is the rule of thumb in the federal common law, is we are supposed to, uh, to follow the intent of the legislature. Um, and that intent, intent should be divined from the plain language chosen by the General Assembly, uh, the state legislature. Um, usually, I think, in my experience, you can discern that, but there are many instances where, believe it or not, uh, the General Assembly is less than plain, less than clear, uh, in how they draft statutes, um, and particularly in Pennsylvania where, unlike the federal system where the statutes can be quite lengthy and quite detailed and sometimes be inconsistent, uh, you have to go into the tools of statutory construction to get there. Um, <clears throat> there are plenty of tools available. I won't recite the Statutory Construction Act word for word, 
Uh, but the bottom line is you only get to the tools of statutory construction where there is, where you cannot glean the intent of the General Assembly from the plain language, meaning there's some sort of ambiguity uh, chosen by the words of the General Assembly. Um, and I emphasize that because uh, often in my practice, uh, when I was on the Commonwealth Court, and I even see it a little bit on the Supreme Court with briefs that I've seen so far raising issues of statutory construction, is lawyers very quickly will run to the tools of statutory construction without first, without first addressing the most important question, which is the statute ambiguous? Is it capable of more than one reasonable meaning? Because if, if it isn't ambiguous, um, the job of the courts uh, is to apply the statute uh, and to interpret it as written by the General Assembly. Um, sometimes uh, that leads to uh, what I think Justice Potter Stewart once referred to as uncommonly silly laws uh, or even absurd laws. Um, but the job of uh, the courts in Pennsylvania is not to save the people of Pennsylvania from silly or absurd laws, it's to save the people of Pennsylvania from unconstitutional ones. Uh, and that's why we exist, and that's what we're supposed to do. So, so the first thing in statutory construction that we have to do is examine the language itself, apply its plain or ordinary meaning, or apply any definitions that were given by the General Assembly, and then give it its meaning. And only if the meaning is unclear from reading the plain language do you get to go to the tools of statutory construction, which, again, are numerous. The idea that the General Assembly doesn't intend an absurd result, uh, looking at the time, manner, and place of the establishment and the reasons for establishing uh, the law in the first place, uh, certain consequences associated with it. Um, you know, other tools of statutory construction, too, that are available that I think are interesting and dovetail a little bit with, uh, with the courts is there's a tool of statutory construction that says once the final highest court of Pennsylvania has interpreted this statute and the General Assembly hasn't altered it, then we are supposed to assume that the General Assembly has accepted that interpretation. Um, so, so that just shows you that even the General Assembly sometimes recognizes the power of the courts to interpret and apply the statutes, and, but have the ultimate power, if they so choose, uh, to deviate from that interpretation by, again, exercising their legislative authority. Thank you. Um, I have another question that's a, a practical uh, question near and dear to the hearts of all lawyers. Uh, I'm going to ask Justice Mundy. Um, this is about petitions for allowance of appeal. How do lawyers get the Supreme Court to hear their case? What should they do? So you've uh, lost your case in one of our immediate appellate courts, the Commonwealth Court on appeal or the Superior Court on appeal and you're not satisfied with the result, so you want to proceed to the Supreme Court. How do you get there? We are a rule-based practice, so consult your rule book, read the, the section on petitions for aliquotter, and follow exactly what it says. It sets forth the recipe for your most likely success. And the tips that I would impart after reading the rule and following the rule is to make sure that the argument that you're presenting to the court isn't about your client and your opposition, but apply the issue to the Commonwealth as a whole. Because we're looking for cases that aren't, but isn't just between two parties. We're looking for cases that impact the Commonwealth as a whole. And the rule itself adds very various categories that speak to those, whether a law is unconstitutional, whether you have different panels of the Superior Court making uh, the uh, different findings based upon the same similar facts. So there's a recipe there for that. And the other thing that I would mention is that um, we are not a error correction court. So don't frame your uh, issue as an error of, of law or an error of fact, I'm sorry, um, but make it bigger so it, it can be something that would apply to other counties, to other litigants across the Commonwealth. Um, and finally, um, another tip that I would add is if the Superior Court or the Commonwealth Court has done something wrong in the adjudication, address that in your petition. Don't use the same briefing format that you used from the trial court to get to the Commonwealth Court or to get to the Superior Court, but address to us in your petition where the Superior Court went off the tracks in their application and how that fits into one of the categories set forth in our rules. If I could just jump in. 
as a caveat, the rules 1114 of, uh, of the rules of appellate procedure. If you read 1114, make sure that's in your aliquot or citing which part of 1114 you're, you're trying to insist. I, I tell my law clerks who have the first eye on it, when I get it, I want to see that highlighted as opposed to see a, re a, a regurgitation of what was filed in the intermediate appellate court. So to me, I'm telling you, a key to catching our eye if you want to do appellate work, is in your petition for review or your alcotter, cite 1114A or this is your basis. You're, you'll be more inclined to see a more positive result. And definitely do not use your uh, your application for re-argument that you use in the <laughs> Superior Court and forget to change the word superior to supreme, which happens <laughs> not infrequently. Um, just, I know Justice Dougherty was just speaking, but. Pennsylvania has a lot of specialty courts that um, we didn't go into before, but I wonder if you'd like to say a few words about the veterans courts and uh, drug courts and other specialty courts that are at, and innovative ways of trying to deliver justice. Of course. Again, pursuant to the administrative arm of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has authorized counties to, on their own dollar, unfortunately, or with funding from other sources to create whatever court is necessary to meet their population. Um, we all enjoy the, the, uh, the, the ambition and the strength of our soldiers, but sadly enough, when they come back from engaging in battle, and for the last 20 years, they've been fighting a, a, a vicious war in, in all aspects of the world, they're coming back, and many are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and Sadly, even more sadly, they're coming back with either some mental health condition or some substance abuse issue, and they're not being treated with the respect and dignity that, um, that we gave them. I, I often say we're there waving flags and clapping for them as they get off the plane, but then they're forgotten. And then when they're in their mother's basement and they hear something uh, like a noise and they have PTSD and next thing you know they explode and the cops are called. Um, they're arrested and they're subjected to unnecessary treatment. And many of them with their conditions are drinking and getting into an argument. And again, the, their result, they're, they're ending up in our jails. So we've made a concerted effort that they fought for us when we needed them. Isn't it time that we fight for them through the judicial system by giving them an equal footing and getting them the treatment that they need? So we've created veteran courts and they're really, really doing well, and we're permitting people to divert out of our system. The system in diversion is not to let you get away with a crime. The system is, let's make you a responsible and productive citizen and still be accountable for your conduct, but let's also take into account what the conduct was and what was the true catalyst for that conduct. Um, that's that's in essence, what we're doing in all our courts. We have an elder court, we call it elder justice court, and our current chief justice has shepherded that, and that's really to protect the elderly population. Pennsylvania has one of the largest, if not the largest, population of seniors in the country. And with this new population comes a lot of uh, issues and concerns. And we just want to make sure that those issues concern, and as you heard from Terry, there were, there, uh, and Jeff, we've had guardian issues. There's many other issues, a loss of title, the you know, scams on the elderly. We're trying to collect that information, collect that data, and develop programs through the different counties as to how we can best accommodate them. Uh, of course, we have drug treatment courts. And we do that so that we don't have to separate and split up families, or we don't want to actually incarcerate our problem away, because as we all know, it's a temporary reprieve. It's not a permanent. Permanency comes from treatment supervision. I was never one of those guys. I used to always say, you, 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 you're not a victim if you, you re, reuse. I was wrong. I've learned that through the course of my experience on the bench. Um, I, 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 it took me a while to think of uh, drug addiction as a disease or alcoholism as a disease. I used to say you're more of a volunteer than a victim. But again, I've, I've grown. So with my growth, uh, so has our court. 
and so, as our and so have our judges throughout the county. So we're creating these diversion courts just to become more responsible to the needs of the people who come through our courthouse. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I have um, one more general question to throw out to, to everyone on the panel, and then I hope um, we've got plenty of time to hear questions while you have all these, uh, all these justices here, hit them with uh, your questions. But the one question I wanted to pose is that right now we're in the unusual circumstance of having a six justice court. So in the minds of you justices, what are the practical and legal implications of um, that for the next year. Who wants to take a break? <laughs> we, don't we do everything by seniority? Yeah. <laughs> Most junior first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, with a 3-3 tie, the decision of the lower court stands. So that's it, in a nutshell. That's the practical. But let me tell you what really happens. When you have a 3-3 tie, you have a court, and currently there's, with the three, we have, what, uh, one, two, three, four Democrats and two Republicans. And if it becomes three, three, despite the fact that we know our decisions are non-political, it's a little frustrating to be accused of being political. And I can share with you, we just had one case, and I'll make it personal, one case in which I sided with Justice Mundy and Justice Robson, and I'm the Democrat. And, uh, you know, people were making mean-spirited, if not outright, rude comments that I, I, I'm a traitor. And I'm thinking, this is the law. This is not politics. I made a decision. Well, the other two, the, your colleagues, they, the, the other Democrats voted this way. I disagree with them. So that's really what we have to face. And you don't realize that then the press gets involved, and then you're labeled, and then you're attacked, and then you're trying to be impeached. I mean, these are the real, true results from just trying to do the right thing. Um, so I, I, I'm looking forward to a new colleague so that we're not put into this position. And I'm not going to shy away. I, I say, look, this is who I am. This is how I'm going to make my mind up, as my colleagues are. And we're not Democrats and Republicans when we're making our decisions. We're justices, and we're really trying to apply those facts with our interpretation of the law. Would you agree? Yeah. I think that the real shame in having a 3-3 decision is that it's a plurality opinion. So after we spent the time and the parties have spent the time and effort to bring the case before the court, we think about it and we read about it and we publish great opinions, but in the very end it's a really a, a non-precedential opinion. And so that issue to have precedent needs to come back around to the court when we have a full court. I, I agree with Justice Dougherty that the reason he sided with Justice Mundy and I we were, was we were right. On that case. Look, um, I think Justice Dougherty said it said it earlier about you know I'm I'm holding a position you know it's 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 not about me. I mean the people of Pennsylvania elected me to the Supreme Court, but at the end of the day, nobody's probably going to remember who Justice Robson was at one point in time, but they will remember the court because the court will always be there. Um, uh, I have tried throughout my uh, judicial career uh, to always uh, reach a majority decision if you can reach one. Sometimes that means you don't get everything that you think should be in the opinion. Sometimes it doesn't mean that the opinion went as far as you wanted it to go. But if you can get a majority of judges on your court or a majority of justices to agree on, on, on something um, that decides the case, that's better than a splintered decision. So, so I have all, because it's better for the court and it's better for the people of Pennsylvania uh, to see that from the court. So I will always strive to do that. What does a six member court mean? It means you have to work harder to do that. Um, uh, we have six very different justices from very different backgrounds, and you don't uh, get elected running statewide as a Supreme Court justice with having, without having a little bit of an ego. Um, so, so we all believe that we, we have something to say on cases. But, but you know, look, I, I think one of the things that I wanted to point out too, just learning from my first year on the court, is you know, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania is sort of like an iceberg, right? We've all heard this iceberg uh, analogy, uh, this idea that you just see the tip of the iceberg above the water and there's so much underneath. 
Um, there is so much underneath um, that, that all the justices on the court strive to do. I mean, all I have to do is look back at the year that I had <laughs> this year. Um, we, you know, not, you know, about a month or two after I even got installed, we were having a special oral argument on congressional redistricting uh, because the General Assembly and the governor couldn't agree to do what they're required to do under the Constitution and, and, and agree to a map. We ended up having to do that because they didn't do their jobs. Um, then, on top of that, we did state redistricting. Uh, magisterial district courts had to be reestablished through the court. Um, we dealt with mail-in you know, mail voting and a challenge to the mail-in mail law, Act 77. We dealt with undated mail-in ballots. On top of that, uh, we celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Supreme Court in Philadelphia. And on top of that, unfortunately and sadly, uh, even personal sadness for all of us, we lost our Chief Justice unexpectedly. Uh, but on the flip side of that, got to sit through the elevation of the first woman to be Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Um, and while we're doing all of those things, going back to the Alicotter question that we got, you know, we're reviewing these Alicotter documents, uh, these Alicotter petitions, and the one thing I want people to understand is um, it's not like justices are throwing these things down the stairs and, and figuring out which ones fall on which steps, and that's the one we're taking. Um, the amount of work that goes into reviewing every Alicotter petition is something that I never really realized, even as a Commonwealth Court judge. Every one of them is reviewed very carefully by all the justices and, and, and the chambers. So, so this is an incredibly hardworking court, uh, incredibly hardworking justices, incredibly well-run court doing the people of Pennsylvania. Um, and I share Justice Doherty's viewpoint that I have always bristled whenever I see them write an article about any court that says, even the federal court, referring to the judges as who they were appointed by, um, whether this was a Biden appointment or a Trump appointment or a, or a Obama appointment or what have you, or a, a justice run as a Democrat or Republican. Um, I have seen justices make decisions based on their experience, based on their personal viewpoints of the law and things like that, but I do not see justices making decisions based on whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Um, and, and that's what I think um, I want the people of Pennsylvania to understand has been my experience as, for one year on this court. Um, and I certainly welcome Justice Doherty to join me in any decision that I make <laughs> going forward. Which will, of course, be right. <laughs> but let me add to that with regard to the iceberg analogy. As a lawyer, I remember picking up a Supreme Court opinion and reading it and then thinking, well, why did the court not answer this issue? Or there are three issues. Why didn't they get to the meat of this particular point? And I have to tell you, being in now on the court, as Justice uh, uh, Robson just said, there's times when, let's say, I want this position. I actually I want it all, but nobody's accepting the, my secondary position. So the only position I could get through with the majority vote is this one. So I have to write an opinion catering to the, my colleagues so that I can get them to join me, which means I have to excise the part of the, the, of, the, of the opinion that is really what I, as a trial lawyer, want to read. And, you know, and it, it happens. And then I get frustrated when, again, you read a criticism. Oh, this opinion was very weak on, on, on substance as a basis. Why, wasn't, why didn't the court answer this question? And I sit back and think, because we needed four votes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking, let's just correct it. If I have to go slow and steady, at least we'll win the race. I don't want to lose the issue. When you see something that's granted by Alicotter and then improvidently granted by us afterwards, many times it's as a result of our review of the Alicotter is superficial until we delve into reading the briefs. And then once we read the briefs, we realize, hey, we missed that issue. Or that's not really how it was portrayed. Or we get together and we can't come to a consensus. So the answer is, you know what, it's, it, it's better not to write an opinion than to create bad law. So we improvidently grant it. And that's not, how should I say, that's not willfully done. That, or I should say it is willfully done. It's not, it, it takes great angst for us to decide to what we call IG, improvidently grant a case. Because we realize there's lives at stake, there's hours of lawyers uh, putting work into, you know, they're drafting their briefs and c consulting with these experts. There's a lot going on here, and we just don't want to, 
be so brash as to say, we're not going to handle that. So when you see an improvidently granted case, realize that a lot of thought and, and uh, thoughtful consideration was given into that before that decision was made. Any other thoughts on that from the panel? I think Chief Justice Saylor presided on a court that was even less, that was a less than yeah. six. <laughs> would you have three? <laughs> <laughs> and had to bring up some justices at some point in time. So he might have Yeah, for one case, but uh, in my years, uh, we operated sometimes with, uh, many times with six justices. Uh, as Justice Robson said, there was a period of time before the 15 election we had, we were down to five. It was very pleasant because it's easier to work with five people <laughs> than seven people, and, and I would have preferred one. <laughs> but the final thing on the six-member court, it's frustrating. And the U.S. Supreme Court went through that experience uh, after Justice Scalia's. And there are cases that need a decision, and they have to then be put down 3-3, which means you affirm the Court of Appeals. But I, I think a court strives mightily if the, if the issue can be put over, uh, if it's not that pressing, to just put the issue over awaiting the arrival of a new colleague, either by appointment or election. Any questions for the justices? I am, and we have, and we are. Um, through, because I had this, because the court has granted me the permission to move with autism, I've merged it with the Office of Children and Family in the courts, and I, we figure if we can address the ch child welfare, and if we can get to our youth quickly, and learn that they are on the spectrum, and we can get them provided the necessary services, they have a better opportunity to succeed in their life. In that regard, we developed a task force from the Commonwealth, and the task force has come up with an environmental study in which we're currently applying it to a Philadelphia courtroom, and we have service dogs probably throughout the majority of our counties now in our court system, and we just received some, we have additional funding and we've got permission from the feds, it's a federal grant, to create like a support, we're, we're, create, we're going to support a SAC where there's fidget toys and, and soundproofing. Um, that there's a, a plethora of these things, and we're giving it to each head judge so that the courtrooms could use it. Because the funding is strictly allocated for child welfare services, we're giving them to smaller counties in particular because it, that is a judge that could use it through the entire process, you, in your criminal case or your orphan's court case. And it, it, we understand it financially, it's permissible, legally it's permissible. So yes, the answer is yes, we're doing it out in Allegheny County. They, uh, there's one judge out there who has been phenomenal in advocating and obtaining funds for that county only. And so we're watching. And like I said, we have champions in like Homing County. I was just telling Judge Brobson, Justice Brobson, I was with one of his colleagues who's now a friend, this new Judge Ryan's here in Lycoming County, is like becoming a star by it, it, making his county aware. We have other counties, Judge Minor, 
You know, there's a, a star statewide with him educating the judiciary and our stakeholders with the experiences of a judge and someone who, 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 who has knowledge of this. So yes, sir, we absolutely are. Slow and steady will win the race, that's my motto. So we're trying to do the best we can with as little as we have and spreading it to everyone. I would uh, just encourage you all to take with you a brochure that was created in um, commemoration of the court's 300th anniversary. Um, it is um, been done by the court. Uh, we reached out for a, a historian and their, their acknowledgments on the back covers, but these people work very, very hard. In addition to uh, an attorney, John Hare, from the law firm of Marshall Dennehy, who helped edit the um, historical materials. Um, but it has a nice history of the court. It has um, a complete listing of the uh, Supreme Court justices by using your camera on the back. And I'd also encourage for those who are in the audience live at the law schools um, and this courtroom who may be interested in the history of the court is the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, Life and Law in the Commonwealth, also edited by John Hare. It's a, a, a great piece of history uh, if you have, have more uh, curiosity about more history with regard to the court. And I think someone started to raise their hand and we didn't mean to, there you go. Well, you preach it to the choir, as you know, I authored that yeah. with, with yeah. colleague support. Yeah. But yes, I, 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 as a former assistant district attorney and as a former defense attorney, I'm a, it was back in the day we called it in rape Buchanan verbonis. I'm a proponent. What that stands for, who doesn't practice criminal law, as long as you have other relevant, legally credible evidence at a preliminary hearing, the use of hearsay is permissible. But historically, the Supreme Court Rules Committee took a deep dive into that rule, and the basis, sadly, was Philadelphia-centric in that we had massive amounts of discharges at a preliminary hearing for witnesses failing to appear. So the Rules Committee took that because of the, vol the volume of cases being thrown out, and they, they turned around and said preliminary hearing, hearsay is permitted to be used to prove an element of the crime, and that was kind of contorted by some prosecutors just to use hearsay throughout the whole case. Ricker first came down the pike, and then there was a whole issue, as I said, uh, and I kind of, in the back of my head, I was thinking of Ricker and McClellan when I was talking about the IP, because we had the IG want the Ricker, and it was not necessarily what I wanted to do, but it was the way that wait for McClellan, and McClellan came back and, as you know, kind of resurrected the concept. There's a group of, there's a, there's a, there's a thought process that this case, Verbonance, was a plurality decision and didn't carry precedential value. 
So what we ended up in McClellan doing is saying, no, it does carry precedential value. And now there, has, there should be use of other relevant, legally credible evidence introduced at a preliminary hearing, and it can't be based strictly upon hearsay. No, but I, 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 look, I could just tell you when you say, make, when you say that the Supreme Court allows it, I'm going to candidly uh, and gently correct you and say, we don't allow anything. We're not aware of it until right now. Um, and I don't want there to be this impression that the court permits or endorses or encourages bad behavior in anyone. We don't accept it from lawyers. We don't accept it from judges. We don't accept it from each other. So I just want to share that. This is the first time I'm sure any of us have heard it, and we have the court administrator here. So it, 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 we'll discuss it. And, and also, to the extent there are, and I'm not saying this is a specific example, but there are many opportunities for uh, lawyers and sometimes judges to offer comments or suggestions for, to the rules committees to look into areas that have come up that, that in, in some aspect was not foreseen or there are problems uh, that were not foreseen and ask the Rules Committee to look into it and make a recommendation to the Supreme Court. And then it will be back to the court, but that is also uh, an avenue for calling issues to the attention of a body appointed by the court to consider them and gather evidence yeah. about them. But it might Am I understanding you correctly that you're, what you're really telling us is that there are judges and prosecutors who are ignoring the rule of law? That's what I thought you said. <clears throat> well, if I could, so there, there are avenues to deal with that. One avenue is obviously an appeal. Um, second avenue is if judges are not following the law, one of their obligate, you know, we, we have Article 5 of the Pennsylvania Constitution and the judicial conduct process that you could bring those judges to the attention of the appropriate authorities. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you that that's the avenue in our Constitution to address those matters other than your appeal. And the one thing I realize being one of the justices on this court that has zero experience in criminal court, zero. Um, but I don't think Justice Docker, you did land use and zoning either. So we're kind of even on that, um, is that, um, I don't know whose job is harder in Pennsylvania, the prosecutor or the defense counsel. I think that, that those cases when you're dealing with victims, when you're dealing with the accused and the rights and the interests that have to be balanced by the prosecutor and by the defense counsel throughout that entire process and by the judge is, is along with family court, is probably the hardest uh, area of the law for judges and the lawyers to be immersed in. And I have a lot of respect for, for all those decisions. Um, I wasn't on the court, obviously, when McClellan was issued. McClellan wasn't much of a surprise to me because we have a very similar 
um, paradigm in the administrative law context. Um, administrative agencies, for anybody, all, ra raise your hand if you do administrative, yeah, I didn't think so. Um, oh, well, there we go, hey, all right. Um, so, so administrative agency law is kind of like the wild, wild west. You know, there's really not a whole heck of a lot of rules, and particularly the rules of evidence don't apply too stringently, but one of the rules in, in administrative law is the Walker rule, and the Walker rule is basically, um, uh, hearsay is, he, you, if you object to hearsay evidence, it can't be used to support a finding of fact. If you do not object to hearsay evidence, it can't be used as a finding of fact unless it's corroborated, uh, unless there's other corroborating evidence. And I sort of understood McClellan as being sort of a Walker rule kind of a thing, which is it's not that you can't use hearsay, but, but there has to be corroborating evidence of record that's admissible. So it wasn't a big surprise. But it was, I think, I think fairly um, a change. Maybe, may, you know, I think I could see how some people might think it was a change and not simply, uh, and, and some people might even say it was a new rule or a new interpretation. But I'm with Justice Stockard in the sense that I think lawyers, I think criminal defense lawyers, prosecutors, family lawyers, administrative lawyers, judges throughout the entire system are obligated to follow the law. And I think McClellan was fairly clear. My son's a public defender in Philadelphia, so I have respect for the office. And as an assistant district attorney, I've tried some of my best cases against a public defender. And for those who say, that, oh, I want a real lawyer, shame on you, because the best lawyer who knows the system and the judge and the law is a public defender. And the concept that we don't public, we don't, uh, uh, well, we don't have sustainable financial aid to them is an embarrassment, I believe, to the people of Pennsylvania via our government. These, are, these, these funding issues are very thorny because as the court, we don't fund anything. We get our funding from, from, from the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, there is historically, um, and, and Chief Justice Saylor I know remembers this well, uh, there was one time in the history of the Supreme Court when this court attempted to force the General Assembly to fully fund a unified judiciary um, and issued uh, an actual order <laughs> directing, uh, sort of a mandamus, if you will, directing the General Assembly to fully fund uh, the unified judiciary. And uh, I think reissued that order, I don't know how many times, uh, and finally gave up. Yeah, that's a fair, a fair story. Yeah, finally, finally gave up. Um, I think we've we, funding cases. I think are before us and have come before us. Um, they present very thorny issues. Personally, um, I don't think we fund our public defenders enough. I don't think we fund our prosecutors enough. I don't think we fund our police officers enough. I don't think we fund our teachers enough. Um, but but it's just not something that we have a lot of control over. Yeah, we handled a case a few years ago. If I'm not mistaken, Justice Weck wrote an opinion regarding Luzerne County's public defender. I, I can't recall the exact situation, but I, I knew it had to deal with the issue of funding the office. Yes, sir.
we have great respect for free war. But we know how hard we work. But this presentation should be made to those people out there who don't. Um, you know, what we hear, what we hear about the work of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is one of the best houses. And that always was in terms of how many Democrats and how many Republicans voted what way on a particular issue. And it's always but, but if I could respond, sir, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're right. We're not permitted to run to the papers and respond, nor should we. But my personal hope and desire and effort with my colleagues would be that you guys are the leaders of your community. You're the people who speak to the people who most need help and are the people who will decide whether they think we're fair or not. And maybe by us presenting to you and sharing with you uh, a peek, as I say, behind the curtain of as who we are and how we operate, maybe you're going to realize that we're not a political court, that we're a group of lawyers that we're lucky and we agree and disagree, but we enjoy each other's company. We do the best we can for the, what I really believe is the most altruistic reasons. And it's up to us to hope and pray that maybe you guys will walk away and tell People, you know what? They're not a political court. They're just people trying to do a good job. We can't beat back the press. Oh, so you imagine when you're on our side. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah it, it 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 hurts your feelings, but I guess you got to get a tough skin. I mean, it, no, I'm talking me. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I will turn it back over to Justice Mundy to uh, conclude. Yeah, I would just uh, like to thank President Judge Wheeler for his kind hospitality today and to uh, the President of the Bar Association, Ann Leet, for her work putting this CLE program together. And also special thanks to Lori Wales from my chambers who did all the groundwork for us. So, so nice to see each and every one of you. Thank you so much thank for sharing you. the day with us. Thank you.